Okay, let me uh, say a quick word of prayer for us so we can jump into this lesson. Wonderful Heavenly Father, Lord, we're so grateful to be gathered here today uh, to worship and uh, to study our Creator and our Savior today. Father, we just want to lift Him up and we ask for your Holy Spirit's presence to be amongst us, to dwell in us, in our hearts and our minds, to open our hearts and our minds, to give us wisdom and understanding of that which we are about to endeavor into, Father. We're so grateful for your word, Father, and we just ask for your blessings, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so as usual, I'm going to start, well, first of all, with uh, the lesson study is lesson nine, and it's the rhythms of rest. The rhythms of rest, hopefully we can find out what this rhythm of rest entails. Um, so the memory text is found in Genesis 2, verse 3. And I think that's kind of really our focal point, not that we're going to stay there the whole time, but the focal point really is Genesis today and the creation. Um, okay, and it reads, Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work which he had created and made. Okay, so that text is very reminiscent of other places in the Bible um, that talk about the same wording not exactly but it is always the same wording from Genesis and you can find it all the way in Revelation when it's reading this message of course we find it in uh, Exodus 20 um, and in Genesis here okay so if you just read the beginning I'm going to just try to breeze through it so we can get through as much of this as possible but um, so you know who can imagine how it was at creation you know just imagining things being right before our eyes created the most incredible things, you know, the, the heavens, the, the moon, the stars, the animals, us. Um, you can't even really imagine what that would be like with God speaking everything into existence. Um, but after all this creating, God turned his attention to something else. At first glance, it did not seem as spectacular as all of these other things he created, of course, that I mentioned. Uh, he gave us a day of rest. He created a day of rest. And he made it special. Even before humanity was dashed off to self-imposed stressful lives, God set a marker as a living memory aid. God wanted this day to be a time for us to stop and deliberately enjoy life. A day to be and not to do. I like that. To celebrate the gift of all that he created. You know, the, the grass, the heavens wildlife um, so this invitation would continue even after the first couple was exiled from Eden so of course we know the Sabbath is a perpetual ongoing throughout eternity uh, God wanted to make sure that the invitation could stand the test of time and so right from the beginning he made it into the very fabric of time itself which is also pretty fascinating okay so we're going to look again at the what rest entails, and especially concerning the Sabbath rest. Um, okay, so any questions so far? Any comments so far? No? Okay. Let's go to Sunday then. Uh, the heading is Prelude to Rest. Um, so, of course, it's going to lead us right into Genesis 1, 1 through 31, speaking of the whole creation up until the Sabbath. Uh, so if you guys want to just turn there while I just go ahead and just glance over. Uh, the Lord, uh, So God was there at the beginning. The Lord spoke it, and it was light divided day from night. Firmament, sky, and seas were spoken into existence on the second day. Dry land and vegetation followed on the third day. God formed the basic framework.
fill the space prepared by God. Okay. So the question for Genesis 1, 1 through 31 is, good morning, happy Sabbath. What did God's evaluation indicate about creation? What did God's evaluation indicate about creation? Okay, so of course we don't have time to read all of this. I mean, I could read through it quickly, but for the sake of time, I'd rather just get to some other things that might be uh, bring more light into this topic. So we know the creation, most of us, I believe, right? We, we pretty much are familiar with Genesis and the six days leading up until the seventh day, right? So the question is, uh, what did God's evaluation indicate about creation? Pretty simple. Any cases? Well, let's take a look. Uh, if it was good. Uh, he indicated that it was good, right? Up until the seventh day, what does he say? then after he sees everything that he's created he says that it was very good right he looked at everything that he created the heavens the the earth the animals everything on the earth and he saw everything that he created and he said after he created the sabbath that it was very good right okay Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. That's right. Yes. 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 Absolutely. Yeah, math, mathematicians can explain that better as far as the number seven being an absolutely perfect number. Uh, you know, every time we hear that word perfect, uh, it can be translated, you know, because people think perfect is like robot, you know, everything is absolutely, but no, it just means uh, complete or finished. Yeah, absolutely. That's right. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, and interesting enough, like you said, you know, uh, we, we have an understanding of what a day consists of, you know, uh, a month, a year, but there is no explanation for the seven, the seven day week. You know, there is nothing in the stars and the heavens that point to a seven day week. So where do we get the week from? Well, obviously we get it from God in the book of Genesis. Uh, yeah, thank you for your comments, brother. I appreciate it. Uh, so, in Genesis 1, 26 and 27, 
and Genesis 2, 7, 21 through 24, um, says what was the different or what was different about the creation of humanity from the rest of the world. Uh, so what was the difference? What was the difference in humanity as uh, different from everything else God created? Okay, that's one thing for sure is that, you know, the animals and everything else wasn't created in God's image. Absolutely. Uh, what else? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. You know, people often, I've heard people before say, we're, an we're just animals, you know. They don't make any distinction between us and the animals. But God makes that distinction very clear. And there's so many things that differentiate us from animals. You know, the ability to reason, the ability to create. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. But God says that we were created, unlike the animals, in his image. You know, it's kind of interesting because science always tries to bring us back to that, oh, we came from monkeys, you know. Oh, so we were created in the image of, of that animal that has not these abilities that we have. You know, they don't see any, they don't make any distinction. But yeah, so uh, one of the other things is that when God created everything else, he spoke it into existence. But when it came to man, he got down to the ground, to the dust of the earth, the mud, literally, and formed him. It was an intimate thing. It was different. And he breathed into his nostrils, his breath, his life. But yeah, that's the difference also, is it was an intimate thing when it came to creating man, different from that of everything else that he created. So are we different? Are we special or separate from everything else? Yes, according to God. I mean, and it doesn't take a genius to figure out, as I mentioned, it's easy to see that we're different than the animals. You know, we're not the same. Um, so that's, uh, it says, yeah, God stooped and began to shape mud. Humanity's creation in God's image and likeness was an object lesson in intimacy and closeness. So I think that's really nice that... Uh, you know, God takes the time out to get that close to us in creating us. Uh, God bent down and breathed into Adam's nostrils, and there was a living being. Eve's special creation from Adam's rib added another important element to creation week. Marriage was part of God's design for humanity, a sacred trust of partnership between Ish and Isha, man and woman. So, do you guys, can you see what... what being said there and what I just read I'm going to re I'm going to repeat a certain part again it says an important element to creation week marriage was part of God's design for humanity so he creates Adam and Eve and the marriage thing on the seventh day right an intimate relationship right is there an intimate relationship we're to have with God on the seventh day absolutely is he are we married to him Absolutely. The Bible tells us that the bride is the church, right? And originally the bride was Israel, God's people, right? And I won't go on. I mean, eventually they get divorced, but, you know, then God comes into another relationship. But that's a whole different lesson. Okay. Um, let me just read the bottom because I like what it says. It says, think about how radically different the biblical creation story is from what humanity without the guidance of God's word, teaches. What should this tell us about how much we need to depend on God's word for understanding truth? And I love that, you know, because there's a huge difference between, as I mentioned, you know, uh, science tells us we came from monkeys, right? <laughs> um, but God tells us that we were created in his image. This is why we have all these abilities where animals can't create. We can create. Which, by the way, that's one of the main reasons that ha Satan hates us so much is because he is not able to create or procreate, just like the angels. And God has given us that special ability that we, like God, are able to, remember he said, go out and, right, fulfill and, or replenish and subdue. Uh -huh. 
Oh no. Oh, oh wow. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's interesting you say that because, by the way, uh, most uh, famous people, discoverers, uh, scientists, uh, you know, the list goes on. Um, like take Copernicus, for example, or anybody else along those lines, uh, even um, Albert Einstein, uh, most, except for the exception of Albert Einstein, although what he believed is what I'm trying to say, is that most of them, almost all of them, were Christian, dating way back, okay, that when they studied these things, it led them, like you said, closer to the understanding of the Creator, the true God. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I mean, I mean, even Albert Einstein, you know, when he later on, after discovering more of what he was searching for, acknowledged that there was a creator. So yeah, so I can, I totally get that. Um, okay, uh, so any other comments before we move on to Monday? Okay, Mondays is the command to rest. Um, so I'm just going to breeze through the top here. Uh, it says creation may have been very good, but it was not yet complete. Creation ended with God's rest, the special blessing of the seventh day Sabbath. Then God blessed the seventh day, we know, um, and, and rested from all his work and uh, sanctified it or hollowed it. Uh, the Sabbath is part of a parcel of God's creation. In fact, it is the culmination of creation. God made rest and created a space for community where, com- where humanity in those days, the poor family of Adam and Eve, could stop their day-to-day activities and rest side by side with their creator. Unfortunately, sin entered this world and changed everything. There was no more direct communion with God. Instead, there were painful births, hard work, fragile and dysfunctional relationships, and on and on the litany of woes that w- we all know so well as life on this fallen world And still, even amid all this, God's Sabbath remains an enduring symbol of our creation. So it's kind of amazing through everything that's transpired throughout the thousands of years, the one thing that hasn't changed or gone away is God's Sabbath, right? It still remains today. Uh, And also, hope and promise of our recreation, if humanity needed the Sabbath rest before sin, how much more so after and I like that, you know. Um, how much more do we need in a sin-filled world? Uh, many years later, when God freed his children from slavery in Egypt, he reminded them again of this special day. So let's take a look at that. Uh, Exodus 20, uh, verses 8 through 11. And the question is, what does this teach us about the importance of the Sabbath as it relates to creation? Okay. So Exodus 20, of course, we know particularly eight is where we find the sabbath day right and i always encourage us as adventists if we have not memorized that i would encourage you to memorize at least the fourth commandment if not all of them and the reason i say that because we are seventh day adventists if we're going to be a good witness we really need to understand what is being said in that and the only way to really understand it is by going over it and over and memorizing it so that we can be a good witness when people ask us, well, what's so important about the Sabbath day? What are we supposed to do on the Sabbath day? And on and on. Okay, so um, it says, what does it teach us about the importance as it relates to creation? So how does this, let's take a look at it just briefly. 
Um, so, you know, uh, what it basically does, I'm not going to read it all or quote it all, but, you know, we know that it starts with remember. Um, so God tells us, you know, you do all your work, but the seventh day is the day that the Lord had made in it. You're not to do any rest. Your servants, notice he starts first with your son and your daughter. God always starts with the family first, in case you did not know. Jesus Christ always started with the family first. Okay, when he came to, 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 to earth, who did he go to first? He didn't go to the Gentiles first. He went to the Jews first, right? Because that was his people, his family. So first and foremost, uh, your son, your daughter, your slaves, he's saying to give rest. And your animals are supposed to rest, and even the stranger within your gates, which usually meant a foreigner. When the, we see the word stranger, it usually means foreigner, okay? But in our time, stranger is anybody that's at your home, visitor or whatever it be. Anybody that's outside of the family is supposed to rest too. So I wouldn't want to put somebody to work for me on the Sabbath because it would basically be the same thing as a stranger. So again... Um, how does it relate to creation? Okay, well, if we look at the bottom, it says, with each Sabbath, in a special way, we're called to remember who they really were, being made in the image of God himself. Speaking of, because we know that what we're looking at was given to the children of Israel at that time, right? So that's what it's telling us. It was that showing them that they were beings made in the image of God himself, right? Because he says in verse 11, it's right there. He says, for in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, pointing us back to what we saw in Genesis, right? 1 through 31, the creation week. The Sabbath points us back to the creation. For in six days the Lord made heaven and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. So that's how the Sabbath relates to creation. It tells us right there. It points us right back to what God did in the beginning. So he reminds us who we are, who he is, and where we came from. Right? And isn't that basically what everybody, the, the big question, people want to know, one of the big questions, who we are and where we came from and where we're going, right? So if you truly want to know where you came from, well, it's right there. Just look at the fourth commandment. Go to Genesis, right? God gives us a clear picture of all of it. Okay, um, and since the Sabbath is a memorial of the work of creation, Ellen G. White writes in The Desire of Ages, it is a token of the love and power of Christ. Why does she say that, the love and power of Christ? Well, first of all, we see the creation is showing us his power, right? We see that giving us a day of rest, knowing that we would need it, is a token of his love. And also, as, as we move forward, we're going to see how it relates to God being um, uh, our Redeemer and how the Sabbath is also showing us redemption. Not only rest, but it shows us Christ being the Creator and our Redeemer. Okay, How so? Well, in the same way, you know, uh, when you look at Exodus 20 at the very beginning, uh, let's just take a look. If you can go there, just let's just go there just briefly. Go to Exodus 20. Just wanted to point one little thing out. So if you look at verse 2, it says, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Okay. What is the story of Moses in Exodus really about? It, it, it really is, Moses was a Christ type. Why? Because he came to deliver his people from bondage. What is bondage a representation of? Sin. Okay. So if we go back again to 20, 
you know, it, it, God is telling us there right in the second verse, I'm the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Right? So you can really translate that as redemption. Because it's the same example that Moses was giving, being a Christ-like, as I mentioned. Okay. Um, so we'll get, we're going to see. We'll talk about that a little bit more uh, in, in Wednesday's lesson. But uh, is there any comments so far? If not, we're going to go to Tuesday's lesson. Okay. Tuesday's like a lesson is new circumstances. New circumstances. So after 40 years, there was a new generation. Uh, and it says uh, a new generation with vague, if any, memories of Egypt. Okay, so... The people that we're talking to eventually after the 40 years, we have a totally new generation of, of Israelites, of people, right? This is the reason we have the book of Deuteronomy. Does anybody know what Deuteronomy means? Translated, it's just a copy or a repetition. So Deuteronomy is basically Moses repeating the law. Why? Because it's a whole new generation now. Okay. Where before it was their their parents, right? Well, now it's the children. And he doesn't want them to forget, so he reminds them. Which, by the way, interesting enough, you know, the first time Moses spoke in Exodus, you know, he wasn't confident in speaking. He didn't want to speak. But in Deuteronomy, he does nothing but speak the whole time. Big change, right? Big change in Moses, even after 40 years. Um so they had a very different life experience from that of their parents. This new generation had witnessed their parents' continued lack of faith, and as a consequence, they too had to wander in the wilderness as their parents, as their parents' generation died off. Uh, they were privileged to have the sanctuary in the center of their camp and could see the cloud indicating God's presence hovering over the tabernacle. When it moved, they knew it was time to pack up and follow this cloud that provided shade during the day and, and light and heat at night was a constant reminder of God's love and care for them. Okay, so uh, Exodus 16. So we're backing up a little bit from 20, okay? And it says, what personalized reminder of the Sabbath rest did they have? What personalized reminder of the Sabbath rest did they have? So... If you take a look at uh, Exodus 16, 14 through 31, can somebody answer that question for me? What we're looking for? It's talking about manna. So, was that, how, how do we put the manna into the picture of a reminder of the day of rest? Now, keep in mind, this is Exodus, Exodus 16, so Moses hasn't even gotten up to the mountain yet to give the Ten Commandments. Okay? But interestingly enough, so so think about it. When people uh, at times will, you know, when they're challenging you on the Sabbath day, and, you know, people have all these different things, they say, you know, the Sabbath was made for the Jews, um, and on and on and on. Um, a lot of times people think that it, it started at Exodus 20. The giving of the Ten Commandments, because that's where the Sabbath came in. No, it actually. When did when did the Sabbath start? By the way, that's right. It started at creation, right? So, yeah, it. it, it um. Well, you know, if you think about it, these are God's eternal laws it's his character right eternal but here's the thing so if you think about it um we it was it was set up for us when we read in genesis right but that's a good question do you think that in heaven that things might need a rest maybe do you think the angels need to rest what would need to rest in heaven Ah, okay. <laughs> okay. So again, remember, yes, it is worship, it is rest, but it is all about the Creator. It's coming together to put our focus on the Creator. That's what the Sabbath is about, right? So was it around before? Pastor, was the Sabbath? Help me out here. 
Ya. That's right. Amen. Amen. Well put. That's right. That's right. Yeah, amen, amen. Okay, did that help, Ellie? Yeah, yeah. Uh, let, let me. Yes. Um, let me uh, just. Uh, I'm going to back up a little bit. Uh, the Sabbath was embodied in the law given from Sinai, but it was not then first made known as a day of rest. The people of Israel had a knowledge it, uh, of it before they came, into si came to Sinai. On the way there, the Sabbath was kept. When some profaned it, the Lord reproved them, saying, How long refuse ye to keep my commandments and my laws? Okay, so we're going to go back to the... the what the lesson's showing us is um, what personalized reminder of the Sabbath rest did they have? So, yes, they knew already, if you look in 16, uh, 14 through 31. Give me one second, got to back up a second, go back there. Um, so, they had known because of the manna. The manna was an example of the Sabbath. How so? Well, when did the manna fall? When? Yeah, so it, it would fall on a Friday, the preparation day, right? And God told them they were to gather twice as much on that day because on the Sabbath day, it would spoil, right? So right there, you already have the Sabbath, right? And they already knew it. So the Sabbath was not given at Sinai is the point we're making here. Uh, does anybody know what manna, what manna means? What is it? Manna. 
Yeah, it's heavenly food, but that's what it, manna means. What is it? That's what manna means. Because they didn't know what it was. What that? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so um, so anyway, so that's what we've seen here. Uh, let me just read a little bit of, from the last study. It says, contrary to popular theology, these verses prove that the seventh-day Sabbath predicated the giving of the law at Sinai. Okay, so there we have it. Uh, let me just pull something. I'm just going to read the bottom says, this new generation finally was poised to enter the promised land. Israel was about to undergo a change of leadership and an age Moses wanted to ensure that this generation would remember who they were and what their mission was. He didn't want them repeating the mistakes of their parents and so he repeated God's law. As I mentioned, Deuteronomy is a re- repetition or a copy, is what it translates to. Um, it was also repeated that God's law. The Ten Commandments were repeated so that this generation poised on the brink of conquering Canaan would not forget. Okay. Um, I'm going to just read the bottom. I think I got got time for it still. In our personal experience, the second coming of Jesus will never be more than a few moments after we die. Hence, his return is always near, perhaps even nearer than we might imagine. How does keeping the Sabbath remind us not only of what God has done for us, but also of what he will do for us when he returns. Yeah, I like that. Um, okay, I'm just going to move forward. Yeah, I mean, you know, when you think of death, you know, people always say, well, God's saying, Jesus didn't say he's going to been, you know, that the end is near, he's coming soon, he's coming soon, you know. Well, yeah, in one way, he does come very soon because death, the Bible tells us, is, but an instant, a, a, just a brief sleep. Um, anybody ever rendered, been rendered unconscious? Okay, yeah? Okay, it, what's it like? Yeah, it's like you don't exist for a moment, right? You don't even know, you don't know anything, and that's what the Bible teaches about death. So when we die, we are, Christ is near, you know. The second coming is very near because no matter when we die, it, it's just an instant. You can be a dead for a thousand years, and it's, you're not even going to know. So when you close your eyes, the next thing you know, you open your eyes, and there's Jesus. So yes, in many ways, he, his second coming is very near. Okay, uh, Wednesday, another reason to rest. Uh, Israel was encamped on the other side of the Jordan. They had taken possession of the lands uh, of the king of Bashan, or Bashan and two kings of the Amorites. Uh, once again, this crucial moment, Moses called Israel together and reminded them that the covenant made at Sinai was not just for their parents, but for them too. He then went on to repeat the Ten Commandments again for their benefit. Although there is a difference in the repeating. So we're going to see what the difference is. So if you could go to Exodus 20, um, 5, or excuse me, Deuteronomy 5, 12 through 15. What is the difference? So I don't know if you can put them both together. I'm fortunate that I, that I have them right next to each other, and I can easily see what the difference is. So if, if you want, feel free to take that challenge and give us what the difference is in the two. And if not, like I said, because I have them right in front of me, I could, uh, I could do that. Yeah, exactly. Um, did I say we're on, we're on Wednesdays, right? Yeah, another reason to rest. Okay. So yeah, the uh, Exodus 20 starts out with remember. Deuteronomy 12 starts out with observe. Um, it's kind of interesting, too, when you think of remember, because, uh, you know, where had they come from in this point in Exodus? You know, they had come out from from pretty much forgetting who they were as a people, and pretty much, I would imagine... Were they able to keep the Sabbath in Egypt? No? No, they weren't. What did you say? Yeah, remember when when uh, Pharaoh had said, you know, to, to Aaron, you make this people Shabbat, you make this people rest, you know, because they wanted, Moses was trying to get that day of rest, he was trying to bring his people back to God, and interesting enough, it was pointing to that day of rest. Why? Because they didn't have a day of rest. They were slaves. They were working seven days a week. 
you know? Um, and so they had forgotten about who their creator was, who God was. So this is why God brought them out. This is one of the main reasons that God brought them out of Egypt. Remember, when we read, when we read the beginning of Exodus, what does God say? He says, I'm going to repeat it again. I am the Lord your God, which have brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. So this is one of the main reasons, this is one of the main ways that God gets us to remember him. Are we here today talking about God? Are we remembering him today? This is how he does it. As a matter of fact, Ezekiel, um, I think uh, Ezekiel 20, 20 um, tells us, uh, or, or not Ezekiel 20, 20, um, give me one second. Um, Exodus 31, 17, uh, or 31, 13, excuse me. Uh, God tells us, he says that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. Talking about the Sabbath. Speaking of the Sabbath. God says the Sabbath makes us holy. How does the Sabbath make us holy? How does the Sabbath sanctify us? What does sanctify mean, by the way? So let's back up a second. Yeah. That they might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. Yes, yes. So it's all about God. And it's all about him sanctifying us through this. That's right. Ezekiel 20, 20 says, yes, yes, thank you. Ezekiel 20, 20 says, there's a sign between me and you, right? That you might know that I am the Lord, right? Well, 31, 13, that's right. Well, yeah, sanctify us to be made holy. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> yes. So the sanct the Sabbath is God's way of sanctifying us, sanctification, process of being made holy. So it's a process, right? And this is part of the process. Because if we didn't have the Sabbath day, chances are we might wander, right? Away from God because we'd be so caught up in everything that we do that like the Jews or excuse me, like the Israelites, that they forgot about God and their creator. They didn't have a day to celebrate. Um, okay, let's move forward here. So the difference is, that's one of the differences. It starts out, remember, observe. And I think remember because uh, by that time, he's telling them to remember because they had forgotten. And he tells us today because everybody's forgotten. Yes. That's right. Amen. Amen. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Um, yeah, I think the most important thing, you know, uh, on their deathbed, people aren't asking for their riches, yeah, a new house, they're not asking for, what do they, you know, what do, what do people want most when they're on their deathbed? One more breath, yeah. <laughs> well, not necessarily true. Some people are ready to go. Some people are ready to go way before that even. But they, what all they want is they want somebody, just somebody, people, somebody to be there with them. You know, of all the things that a person could want. Um, okay, so, Let's uh, let me just read a little bit here. Um, oh wait, we're still on Wednesdays. I'm getting ahead of myself. So the difference is number one that how it starts, and if we look, everything else is pretty much the same except when you get to 15. And 15 in Deuteronomy 15 says, "And remember that you were sla a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there by a mighty hand and by an out outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you." To keep the Sabbath day. So yes, yeah, so this is Moses reminding them, and he's adding to what was said before, because he really wants them to understand, hey, well, but here's the thing, 
He's telling, were they slaves? The ones that he's talking to now? The new generation? No. So why is he telling them? He says, and remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. In a sense, they were. They were children, right? Even though they weren't literally slaves. Um, okay. So those are the differences. And I'm going to just read a little bit more here. It says, uh, in Exodus 28, the commandment began, remember. Deuteronomy began, observe. Uh, the word remember came a bit later in the commandment itself. Okay, so did you catch that? In this verse, Israel was told to remember that they were slaves, although this generation had grown up free. They would all have been born into slavery were it not for the miraculous rescue. The Sabbath commandment. So they, a lot of them weren't born in captivity. A lot of them were born free, if you think about it, out in the wilderness. The Sabbath commandment was to remind them that the same God who was active in the creation story was also active in their deliverance. And I love that. Do you see the connection? Creation, deliverance. And we're going to talk about that in Thursday's lesson, but I don't want to get ahead of myself. Um, so it says also, I'm going to read this whole part because it's important. It says, The Lord your God brought you out with a strong outstretched arm, Deuteronomy 15, 15. This truth fits then the current circumstances of the Israelites standing for a second time at the border of the promised land some 40 years after the first generation failed so miserably they were as helpless in conquering this land as their forefathers were in escaping from Egypt. They needed this God who acted with that, with a strong hand and an outstretched arm. So notice that's what they're talking about when he says it in Deuteronomy there. He's telling them because they're going to need this God, this almighty God to help deliver them again, right? So it goes on to say, uh, they needed this God who acted, yeah, with an outstretched arm. The Sabbath was about to take an added dimension because God was the God of liberation. Israel was to keep the Sabbath day. Of course, creation is never far from the Sabbath command, even in Deuter Deuteronomy. Uh, despite the added reason to keep it, the liberation of Israel, in a sense, the liberation of Israel out of the land of Egypt is the starting point of a new creation similar to the creation story in Genesis. Did you all catch that? So in other words, this is like another creation story, similar to the one in Genesis. Okay, so it's saying the liberation of Israel out of the land of Egypt is the starting point of a new creation. So when they came out of Egypt, and it was, because think about it, they came out of Egypt, it's saying it was a new creation because it was a whole new start for them and a whole new understanding of, of, of God and everything else, right? Remember when they crossed the Jordan, that was a new birth. It was a baptism. Or excuse me, when they crossed the uh, um, the Red Sea, that what God tells us that was their baptism. So talk about new creation, being born again, right? So this was a whole process of recreating again God's people. Um, and at the bottom it says, and because... The exit is seen, is seen as a symbol of freedom from sin. That is, redemption we can find in the Sabbath, a symbol of both creation and redemption. So it's a symbol of creation and redemption. Hence, in a very real way, the Sabbath points us to Jesus as our creator and redeemer. I love that. So, you know, there's, there's a lot more things to think about and consider other than just the day of rest, you know. Creation and redemption, right? Did, did everybody catch that? How how it, how that similarity, the symbolism? Okay, if anybody didn't, just go ahead and speak up, and uh, I can repeat it. Okay, I think we might be able to get through uh, Thursdays real quick. Keeping the Sabbath um, is the heading, uh, and it says right along with not murdering and stealing is the command to remember the Sabbath Even though the Bible doesn't give us specifics on exactly how we are to keep it. So I'm not going to go into the uh, Actually, I'm going to pull up one verse If anybody is ever unclear about how to keep the Sabbath I know it's not that simple because there's a lot that goes into it. Although it is pretty simple um, So one of the verses that gives an example would somebody like to read Psalm 92 or 
Isaiah 58, verse 13. How about that one? Isaiah 58, verse 13. Ah, yes, yes, yes. I would agree. Would somebody like to take that? You want to read it for us, sister? Or brother? I mean, I could read it if you... Go ahead, brother. Okay. Yeah, it is a reminder of how we should keep the Sabbath. I'm just going to read it and we're going to end on that note. If you turn away your foot from the Sabbath from doing your own pleasure on my holy day and call the Sabbath a delight, because the Sabbath became a burden for most people at one point, this is why Jesus came. Uh, the holy day of the Lord honorable and shall honor him, not doing your own ways, nor finding your own pleasures, nor seeking your own words. Always go to that verse if you need to be reminded of that. So I'm going to end on that note because they want me to say it.